Welcome, guys. Uh, Maggie to uh, Welcome everybody, if you're joining us, we've got uh, Quentin Kronk and meet, uh, meeting our new director uh, soon. We're gonna start at one o'clock. Um, in the meantime, please do use the chat to share where you are and uh, whether you've been to the museum or not before. So go ahead and try out the chat because we'll be using that for questions during the session. Thanks. And that's the chat in either Zoom, if you're joining us on Zoom, or in the Facebook Live. Yeah, you can use the comment section there. Thanks. OK, I think we'll just wait another minute or so just to make sure everyone's got a chance to join us, and then we'll get going. Thanks, Arlene. All right, welcome everybody to BD at Home. Uh, we've got meet our new director here. Uh, we've got Dr. Quentin Kronk, and I've um, now Quentin is the new director of the BD Biodiversity Museum. He also comes from the Department of Botany here at UBC, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get to hear about um, his work with plants uh, using molecular techniques and looking at developmental and evolutionary biology. Uh, also, my name is Nancy. I'm a museum interpreter at the Beatty Biodiversity Museum. We also have Angela here and Kashapa. Uh, and we'll be helping with the questions in the chat and we'll be using the chat to get all your questions. So feel free to type them in any time and we'll get to them as well. Um, I wanted to start off by just letting you know where the Beatty Biodiversity Museum is. We are on the traditional unceded uh, territories of the Musqueam people. Uh, and we are very happy to always uh, learn more about the Musqueam peoples and their, and their culture. Uh, so one of the places you can do that as well is at their website here, www.musqueam.bc.ca. Um, in terms of on the map, here we are in the center, and this is UBC around us. And so we've got um, also, we're right sort of in the center of it. So if you're looking for the museum, You've got uh, the Pacific Museum of Earth very nearby. We're near the Biosciences Building, the Aral Building, um, the Aquatic Ecosystems uh, uh, Research Lab. So all of, we're right there. And this is what it looks like when you're approaching the building and we are open again. So you can visit us in person as well and you'd be coming up to this structure here, this beautiful glass atrium. When you get closer, you can see uh, uh, one of our star uh, specimens, which is our great big blue whales, uh, blue whale skeleton. And uh, if you're coming into the building, 
uh, you will see behind it too, um, let me just go back through the glass, you can see it there. Uh, this is the connected to the Biodiversity Research Center. And so there is over 50 researchers in this building studying all sorts of interesting things, uh, such as ecology, how things connect together, or evolution, how things have changed over time, and many different other topics. Uh, so that building is connected to the museum where we have uh, specimens. And so, uh, like I said, there's the blue whale specimen, but if you go down this ramp, you will, and you'll be underneath the whale skeleton there, the biggest animal ever. Uh, you will actually be with lots of other specimens. Over 2 million specimens are in the museum, and the museum protects them uh, with these cabinets. So they're in rows here. And then there are also windows into some of them so that you can see all sorts of different specimens. Uh, and they are uh, divided into six different collections. Uh, so I'll show you them here. Uh, and as you move through, this is a map of the museum. You can see the different rows here. And today we're gonna be um, also talking about plants, uh, also talking about uh, the directorship but over here is that, that herbarium section. It also includes things that are not plants. So it includes the fungi, algae, lichen, those sorts of things as well. Um, and uh, wait, we're gonna be taking your questions here. Uh, we wanna thank Quentin for joining us and, and for taking the time to do this. So please do type, uh, type in your questions and we'll be reading them out loud uh, through, throughout. Um, uh, and then we'll go back to here. I'm going to throw it over to Quentin now. I'm going to stop sharing my slides here. And uh, thanks again, Quentin. Okay, well, <laughs> well thanks very much. Um, that's, uh, that, uh, that's a great introduction. Uh, it tells, um, tells you all something about the uh, uh, museum. Uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about myself and how I come to be here. Uh, I've had this very long standing interest in botany ever since I was, uh, I was uh, quite young. And uh, uh, so uh, I still work uh, re research on plants. So I thought I'd try and um, just introduce what I'm uh, um, uh, doing um, with, uh, by showing you a few plants that, that mean something to me. So one of the things I do is work with uh, pollination biology. Uh, and one of my favorite plants to work with is uh, this, I'm gonna hold it up. Uh, I think you can uh, probably see that. It's, um, it's actually, uh, a lo uh, the Latin name is Lotus Bertholotii. It comes from the Canary Islands in Spain, off the north coast of, of Africa. And um, uh, there is a lotus, um, uh, that you can see around Vancouver. It, it's got yellow flowers uh, and it's bee pollinated. But this has evolved bird pollination. And what happens is the bird comes with this, creeps along the ground and the birds come along and they don't hover because these are old world birds and they just probe with their beaks into these flowers that have evolved this extraordinary upturned structure. And uh, I, this, I picked this in my garden this morning. And uh, one of the things about this, although it's bird pollinated uh, in its native habitat, the hummingbirds don't go near it because they don't like to feed on the ground. And uh, so it's just, a, it's got all that bird nectar in, in it and the hummingbirds aren't, uh, aren't uh, in, interested. Um, but what we're interested in is finding the, the genes responsible for this rapid evolution to bird pollination, because we know that um, this has evolved um, to be bird pollinated uh, in under two million years, um, and the flowers have completely changed shape. So how did that happen? Uh, that's the question, and uh, uh, we, we've written quite a lot on, on this system. Um, so, um, staying with bird pollination, I'll show you something else. So I, I picked this in my garden this morning too. It's, um, it's a bird pollinated plant. It's actually Crocosmia, very common in gardens. Uh, you probably see this flowering around now. And uh, the humming, my hummingbirds 
in my garden love this. They are just mad, mad for it. And uh, at the moment, uh, it's being visited by a pair of anise hummingbirds who are on it all the time. And um, um, they just hover and probe. But the strange thing is, this plant comes from South Africa. So during its, its entire evolutionary history, it's never seen a hummingbird because hummingbirds aren't native in Africa. So it's actually pollinated by sunbirds. But the hummingbirds don't care. Uh, they, they love it. But it has these very strong inflorescent branches. And this is for perching because the sunbirds have to perch. They can't hover. So these are actually bird perch, stiff bird perches. And I sometimes see the hummingbirds <laughs> perching on these and trying to probe for the flowers. Uh, but um, um, so in a way, emulating the sunbirds of Africa. Um, but uh, so that's, that's a different thing altogether. Um, now, my group um, doesn't just study um, pollination. We also study trees. And one tree that we're particularly interested in is the native cottonwood um, that grows all over the Pacific Northwest. And I, I've got some here. Again, I picked this this morning. Uh, here's our native cottonwood, Populus trichocarpa. And you can see the leaves have this very broad base. And, uh, and here it is. These are big trees. It's, it's probably the tallest growing hardwood in the whole of North America. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a fantastic tree. Um, and uh, uh, what we've been doing is, uh, again, trying to understand the variation because it grows. This same plant grows all the way from California to Alaska. And in California, it's subject to very different climate than we get in Alaska. So um, how does it adapt to these different climates? That's one of the questions. And so we've been using natural variation, if you like, comparing plants from extremes of, of climate and then looking at the, the genomes, the entire genetic information of the plant to understand the diversity within the species. And just to show you a little bit of that diversity, this is one of my favorite cottonwoods. This is the same species, um, but uh, look at the leaves, how long and thin they are compared to the last one I sh showed you. Um, this is um, um, actually a, a natural mutant from the Willow River in, uh, in Northern BC. And uh, uh, it was collected many years ago and we've been growing it. And I would love to know what the genetic change is to make these long leaves. Because I have this suspicion that the same genetic change that led to the evolution of willows, willows and poplars, willows and cottonwoods are very closely related, but the willows have, tend to have very long thin leaves and poplars these broad based leaves. And I suspect that whatever the mutation is in this plant, was very similar to the mutation that led to the evolution of willows. Uh, so it would be, I think, um, quite, um, quite a good illustration of how evolution happens if we could track down the gene for this particular natural mutant. Uh, we haven't, it's, very, it's proving very hard. It's probably just one gene in the enormous um, array of genes that are in the, the cottonwood genome. Um, so uh, I'd be very happy to talk more about, uh, uh, about, about trees, particularly native trees in this part of the world. But I wanted just to complete this, um, this just tour of my favorite plants. I'm gonna show you one that I think will surprise you. And this is, um, this is the stinging nettle, a great favorite of mine. Um, here it is. And one of the reasons that it fascinates me is it exists in, um, in males and females. So this is a male. Uh, you can see the, 
the floral stems, these inflorescences are rather spindly. I'll hold it up. And I'm gonna, now gonna show you a female. So again, I picked these in my uh, garden this morning. And this is a female. And I think you can see if the camera focuses that these inflorescences are much fatter. And, and this is because the seed is developing uh, on those stems. And I have a, uh, quite a big collection of, of nettles um, because I'm fascinated by them. And um, these two, this male and this female, um, these are um, uh, special because I've been searching for um, the best part of a decade for nettles of this sort because they're, they are diploid. That means they only have half that most nettles are tetraploid, meaning they have four sets of chromosomes. These are diploid, meaning they have just two sets of chromosomes. So they have half the, um, uh, the size of genetic information inside them. And that means they're easier to study. So finally, I found a male and a female with this small genetic complement. And at the moment we are in the process of uh, sequencing the genomes of actually not the male, we've chosen to sequence the genome of this female. So we'll soon have uh, a complete genome of, of this. So um, I could talk about uh, stinging nettles for hours, but uh, it's, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, so I, I just show you those plants just to give you an idea of, of some of my interests and what we're doing. And I'd be very happy to take uh, any questions uh, about uh, those plants or indeed any other plants. Okay, then um, can I ask a question of my own? I was wondering if there is an evolutionary advantage to having a higher ploidy level. Why do plants have so many copies, whereas you know animals don't? Yeah. So that's, that's a very good question. And, it, and it's actually a question that is being actively researched in the um, Biodiversity Research Center at UBC. There are a number of experts on ploidy levels or these, these numbers of copies of chromosomes. So I'm thinking of um, uh, Sally Otto, Jeanette Witten, Lauren Riesberg, they've all written on this problem. And on the face of it, yes, more is better. If you double all your genes, then you have two copies of everything um, that uh, it allows fast evolution to happen. Uh, but, you know, there may be, there are also problems to overcome because when you double all the genes, you can get problems with, um, uh, with, with dosage because sometimes the dosage of a particular genetic um, unit is very important. And these have to be sorted out. Um, so, and uh, problems of things like dosage are something that uh, uh, Keith Adams, also in the Biodiversity Research Center, has been studying. So it's a very live topic for us. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Sheila was wondering, with the going back to the cottonwood, um, with the, the long, narrow leaves, she was wondering if it could be called a hybrid. Um, also, Nicole thought it was really striking the differences between those. The, yeah. those so there, there is a cotton, a natural cottonwood um, that doesn't grow in BC, but it grows in, um, uh, it grows in Alberta, uh, south to Wyoming and, and Utah, uh, which is called the narrow leaf cottonwood. And so one th thought that we might have is that maybe that plant was crossed with the narrow leaf cottonwood. However, I don't think that's right. Uh, well, in fact, I know it's not right, um, but there are several reasons uh, for, for that. Uh, and that is one is that uh, this plant with the narrow leaves, I'll hold it up again, uh, this cottonwood with the narrow leaves in BC is, is um, uh, 500 miles or more from the nearest narrow leaf cottonwood. And also the leaves are much narrower even than the narrow leaf cottonwood. Um, and also we've sequenced the entire genome and we see no evidence of any um, presence of the narrow leaf cottonwood genes at, at all. Um, so it does seem to be a mutant, um, but uh, which gene has mutated? 
is still a, pr a problem to be solved. Um, we had a question too from Nicole about how do you go about uh, searching for one particular gene from before we talked. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So in the old days, um, it was extremely difficult because it was like searching for a needle in a haystack because the cottonwood, for instance, has about 45,000 genes. So if you're searching for one in 45,000, if you have to go one by one, it's effectively impossible. But now, uh, fortunately, we have the tools of genomics, which means that we can sequence the entire genome and look at all 45,000 genes together at once. You need a big computer to do that. And uh, there are various problems and pitfalls, but it means that we can, uh, we can have a chance of finding that needle in the haystack because we can, um, we can look at the whole haystack in one go, which is, which is an advantage. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Andy. He's asking about the Canary Island lotuses, and he's wondering if the hummingbirds will pollinate them if you prop the plants vertically so they're off the ground. Um, and also the second part of that is, and do you see native birds pollinate these flowers in your garden even though they've never seen this plant before? Yeah, yeah so that is, that's a fantastic question because very often this plant, because it's a trailing plant, it's very often grown in hanging baskets. And I've never grown it in a hanging basket, but it would be very interesting to see whether hummingbirds went for it in a hanging basket, because it would be much more like their normal fare. Um, but I, I, I've, I've never been able to study it growing in a hanging basket like that, so, so I don't know, but it would be very interesting to, to see. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I, it's a very good question that, um, maybe our ground feeding birds would hop, who hop, hop around on the ground would start investigating the flowers and, and taking the, the nectar. But I've never seen it. Um, it may be that they just haven't discovered it yet. Um, or, um, you know, that for some reason the flowers are just too complex for them to get into. Um, the other way around, um, it will, when we have some hummingbird pollinated plants in the Pacific Northwest. One of our famous ones is the red flowering currant, uh, Ribes, uh, Ribes sanguinium. And that is very commonly grown in Europe where there are no hummingbirds. Uh, but um, the little, in, some little insect eating birds, uh, a particular one is the blue tit, will perch in the branches and suck the nectar with its with its little little beak <laughs> and so although it can't hover it knows that it's found the nectar <laughs> and, uh, so um, but uh, in this case I, I, I think our our little birds haven't found it yet <laughs> maybe not enough people are growing it right right Thanks. Good thought, Andy. Um, so we've got uh, from Joanne on Facebook, is the narrow leaf cottonwood a single tree or is there a stand of trees with the same narrow leaf phenotype? Yeah, that, so as far as we know, it was just a single tree, um, but this was collected many, many years ago by um, a, an expedition from the Provincial Ministry of Forests here in BC who were collecting cottonwoods uh, for uh, plant breeding. And um, they didn't actually record that it was just a single tree, but that's always been the assumption. But we, we, sim we don't have the records. And I don't think anybody has been back to the Willow River uh, to try to, um, to refine the tree um, and see whether, whether it does occur in a stand. I mean, we have the precise coordinates so someone could uh, uh, could go back and try and find it. It is in in quite a remote uh, lo location. Um, a lot of the sampling done by the provincial ministry of forests back then was done by helicopter. Um, so uh, uh, not all these trees are very easy to to uh, to get to again. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, 
So I ha had some other questions that came in earlier. Um, first, uh, one, one of them is, do you have a favorite specimen at the Beatty Museum? Ooh. Well, <laughs> there are a lot of interesting specimens at the Beatty Museum, so it's, it would be a bit hard to pick one. But, um, well, I, I'm not sure I would call it a favorite exactly because it's, a, it's very, very sad. It's, in fact, it's a heart-wrenching specimen, but I think it is one of the most, um, uh, it's a specimen that means a lot. And that is our two, we have two specimens of the passenger pigeon. And the passenger pigeon, as many people will know, is now extinct. And our two specimens were shot in Southern Ontario in the late 19th century and eventually found their way to um, our museum. And shortly after those two specimens were shot, um, the species became extinct. Um, it became extinct in um, 1914 when the last passenger pigeon died in a zoo. I think it was Cincinnati Zoo. But it had be already become extinct in the wild in 1901. So, you know, it, I think it shows to me the extraordinarily, extraordinary vulnerability of species because the passenger pigeon once existed in flocks so large that it almost blotted out the sky when they started mi migrating and they went on their, their migrations. And then because of, of hunting and uh, land clearance, it was just gone. And nobody will ever see a live passenger pigeon again. And I think that is such a warning about how fragile nature is if humans start destroying it. Um, and, uh, and I think those two specimens we have in the museum, two passenger pigeons, are uh, uh, serve as an extraordinary warning. So I, I put those up, not exactly a favorite, but but specimens that mean a lot. Fantastic, yes. Um, so uh, just to give people a little background who have um, who aren't in, within the museum, uh, Quentin is now the director of the museum and will be for the next five years. Uh, so I thought I'd ask a couple of questions about the directorship as well. Um, so I was wondering, if, what are you most excited about at the Beatty Museum? Um, for the next five years, and and what do you think? Hope of what do you hope stays the same, or what do you hope changes? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So, um, I think what is really exciting uh, just at the moment is um, now we've um, the museum has been established now for ten years, and I think we've made extraordinary strides thanks to all the staff here at the museum in getting us up and running getting a public face and um, becoming um, a, a well-loved public museum uh, for Vancouver. Um, but now I would like to see us really concentrating on uh, the research side because there is so much need. Uh, we are living in a time of environmental crisis. Uh, we, have, we have climate change to deal with. We have other types of environmental change. Uh, we have conservation issues. Species extinction um, is, is one thing. How can we contribute? How can our research contribute to solving some of these problems? And uh, what I hope to do as I go forward in my directorship is encourage us to, to get some of these research programs to solve um, these very pressing issues of, of our time. And uh, so that is something I'd, I'd like to see us move forward with. What would I like to change? Well, um, digitization is a big issue for us. Uh, we would really like to digitize all our specimens and have them all available online for people to study everywhere in the world. And we've done a lot in that direction. We've digitized um, uh, hundreds of thousands of specimens, but we have many, many more that are not digitized um, or even databased in some cases. And we really need to finish that because the museum of the future 
as well as being a museum of physical specimens, will be a museum where that data and those specimens are available in the virtual world as well. So anyone can access it from their, uh, their phone or their laptop anywhere in the world. And that is our vision. And we've still got a long way to go for that. So I, I, that is something I would like to see change, a complete digitization of our museum um, so that we can engage fully with the virtual world and all the opportunities that offers because there's uh, you know artificial intelligence is 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 booming now and so things like automatic identification of specimens may be possible when we have uh, a complete digitization so there are some tremendously exciting things out there that's great um, I was wondering too if uh, relationships with other museums or um, other other uh, places uh, outside of the museum would help with those kinds of ideas in the for your directorship. Yeah. So, yeah, there, I could say two things on that front. Um, firstly, locally in UBC, we're fortunate at UBC to have a number of great museums. Um, the most famous is probably the Museum of Anthropology, uh, but we also have the Botanical Garden, um, which is a museum of living specimens, if you like. And we have the Pacific Museum of the Earth, which is a fantastic geological uh, resource. And we have the Belkin Art Museum. So in a sense, the museums together are making UBC a destination, um, a very interesting de destination. And I would like to see us working together more um, to cement that idea of UBC as, as a destination. And also we have many, many common problems and issues um, that working together uh, can be very, very powerful. Um, now, there's a second part to this. That, I mean, so that's the local part. There's also an international world of museums. There are museums vastly bigger than ours, like the Smithsonian uh, or the Paris Natural History Museum. And they are pioneering a lot of very interesting things at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, I think by collaborating and keeping a careful eye on what the, the leaders are doing in this field, uh, we can learn a lot that will help us. But also there are certain areas where we can lead as well. Even though we're, we're a small museum, um, we have some big ideas. Cool. Definitely. Uh, so Nicole says that digitizing all the specimens is a very exciting mountain to climb, which is great. And she says there seems to be more funding available uh, with collection digitization through sources such as Heritage Canada. Um, are you optimistic that funds will be available to make digitization feasible? funding yes yes yeah, so um we certainly hope so i think the message has got through that this is really important um and uh, heritage canada is is forging ahead in uh with this in canada in the u.s um there are various private foundations like the moore foundation who are who are, who are funding um this sort of digitization and, um, and also increasingly, I think um, um, other foundations and even private donors are realizing that this is so important that they want to step in and support and help. And uh, so this is something we will be fundraising for um, and, uh, and, and we, we, we hope we can, uh, we can succeed. Great, thank you. Um, and from Electra on Facebook, it says, uh, does Dr. Kronk have an interest in ethnobotany? The Musqueam people have an extensive knowledge of local plants and med medicinal uses for said plants. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, this is something that uh, is actually very dear to my heart because I think this is where the museum could make a real, um, a real difference. And I would say the key word for me or the key phrase is intercultural understanding because there's no one way of looking at biodiversity. There are a lot of different ways of looking at biodiversity. And you know, we are here on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And for thousands of years, the Musqueam have been interacting with biodiversity 
in unique ways. And I think we can, uh, we can actually do a lot to uh, promote both intercultural understanding and, you know, try, try to, um, uh, uh, to present a diversity of cultural perspectives on biodiversity. And I'm really, I must give a shout out here to the team at the BT because um, uh, the exhibits team of uh, Derek Tan and uh, Kiko stranger Gailey, as well as the education team uh, with uh, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie Chambers, have been working with the Musqueam and working with, uh, with other First Nations groups um, on these issues. And we had a few years ago, some people will remember it, um, an exhibit um, called uh, uh, the um, uh, Sturgeon Harpoon exhibit, which won the Governor's, Governor General's Award. And uh, uh, Derek and Kiko went to Ottawa to receive the Governor General's Award. And this was really taking the um, Musqueam perspectives on biodiversity, in this case, biodiversity surrounding the sturgeon hunt um, in, in, the, in the Fraser River. Uh, and, um, and it was a, a superb exhibition, absolutely extraordinary. And I think it's, it was groundbreaking. And so if, um, if we can do more of that, uh, then um, that I would like that to be uh, a hallmark of my directorship over the last, next five years. I'll also give a plug to that. Um, if you're interested in that, there is information on our website as well to, to get to that. Um, and, oh, and there it is, Nichols uh, put, put the link, uh, uh, bdmuseum.ubc.ca slash uh, sturgeon. So check that out if you haven't seen it before. Uh, thank you. And sort of on that note, um, I wondered if you had any other thoughts about uh, the role of the museum and yourself as director in terms of equity and diversity, access and inclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so th this is a, a very topical and important um, issue. Um, it's what, uh, well, um, access and inclusion, we, we can put under, under one umbrella. So it's usually referred to as, as EDI, equity, diversity and inclusion. And UBC, I mean, while I've been at UBC, there have been tremendous strides made. Um, and UBC has some of the um, the best experts in the world on these topics of, of, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think we exist within the UBC framework, which is driving forward these, these issues. And so our role is to, um, is to make sure that we are part of that driving force underneath um, uh, uh, UBC's um, uh, pr provisions for, for, for these for these these topics but there's also a question of what what can we contribute above and beyond where can we go further and I would refer back to the work we're doing on um, intercultural understanding because that is the big I in inclusion it's it's about um, it, it's about including other perspectives and other cultural perspectives. And I think working with First Nations uh, cultures um, on biodiversity issues um, is, is a tremendous way we can, we can put a BT contribution uh, into this that is, that is unique and powerful. Uh, so so that, that I think is where, um, uh, where I'd li like us to go in particular. Thank you. Um, can we, well, we can go back to the plants maybe a little bit with another question. Um, so uh, do you have a, what is the weirdest flower you've ever seen? Mm, the weirdest flower? Well, uh, that's easy because there's one flower so weird <laughs> that uh, it, um, the, 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 there's nothing to touch it and that is Rafflesia. Uh, so I better explain um, what Rafflesia is. Rafflesia is the largest flower in the world. And the ones I've seen have been quite small about, um, um, well, I, I've seen them in bud and the buds are about a foot across that, that I've seen. 
who were about a foot across, like the, um, a bit like a, a red cabbage. But they would have opened out into a flower about two feet across. And I'm told the largest specimens may be up to four feet across. Uh, but Rafflesia is, is found in the forests of Southeast Asia. And you get it on the forest floor. You just, you're walking along the, on the forest, in the forest, and you suddenly see this, this enormous chunk of flesh, plant tissue, which is it's a single flower. And there's no other part of the plant visible. And that's because the rest of the plant is inside a tropical vine. So it's a parasite of a tropical vine called tetrastigma. And then when it's ready to flower, it pops out of the roots of the vine on the forest floor. This enormous single flower. And it's red, it resembles um, flesh. Um, it's flesh colored, a reddish color, and it, and it stinks like rotting meat. And it's fly, fly pollinated. And uh, I've seen it in uh, Sabah in, um, in Malaysia, uh, in Malaysian Borneo and also in Sumatra. Uh, but again, unfortunately, I wish I'd seen it fully open because I've only seen it in bud. But the buds are like the, these enormous sort of footballs of, uh, uh, and uh, just, just before they open, they have five big petals, e each petal being about, uh, uh, about, about 10 inches to a foot um, long. Um, extraordinary flower. And uh, uh, if you're in, if you're in the forests of Southeast Asia, definitely one to look out for. I, I wonder about that, if uh, why the, this flower is so big, you know, for, for fly, fly pollinating, because you would think the flies would be able to find a smaller flower. But uh, yeah, I've seen pictures, of it. it looks really amazing. Well, it, the size is a completely unsolved mystery, because when they did the, um, the work to find out what it was related to, it turns out to be related to plants in the euphorbia family. Now plants in the euphorbia family have tiny little flowers, some of the smallest flowers <laughs> that you ever get. So for some reason, um, this plant in evolution has ballooned to this enormous size, which seems really completely unnecessary. Um, but it may not be, we may be looking at the wrong place. We may be thinking, why is the flower so big? Whereas what we should be thinking is maybe the flower is big because it needs to produce big fruits because the fruits are dispersed by forest pigs and, and other large mammals. So it's, it may, may be that, um, that a small flower just wouldn't have been able to produce the large fruits to attract uh, pigs from miles around to, to come, and, come and eat them and disperse them. All right, that's great. Um, so uh, I wonder if, you know, it sounds like you've been to many different places in the world to, to look at different plants. Um, do you have a most exciting botanical discovery? Well, yes, that's a, that's a, I suppose I'd, I'd have to say, um, uh, I'd have to go back to my work um, uh, many years ago in the island of St. Helena, which is in the South Atlantic Ocean. And St. Helena has many very special plants. I mean, it's got, got wonderful plants, but the island has been so badly uh, destroyed because it was so fragile when it was discovered. Uh, there were no mammals on the island uh, originally because it's too far from, too far in the middle of the ocean. But the first discoverers introduced goats and the goats really made a mess of, uh, of the plants that had no defenses against grazing. And many plants became extinct. And one plant that I knew had, bec had become extinct because that was in the books was the St. Helena ebony, um, a very beautiful flower. And when I went to St. Helena for the first time, I really hoped that maybe I could refine this St. Helena ebony. And I, I had the good fortune to work with a, the really gifted local botanist, George Benjamin. And we poured over maps and talked to old timers about where the, um, where people had found old bits of wood of, of the St. Helena Ebony, trying to track down where it once grew. And we did a huge walk 
surveying cliff after cliff, looking at cliffs because that's where it might have survived the goats. And eventually, bingo, we found, we saw on, the, on a cliff a plant matching the description. And uh, it was a most wonderful, wonderful feeling that we were the first people to see that plant for well over 100 years, um, uh, about 120 years. And, but it was right at the, uh, in the middle of a cliff. And so we had to wait until we could find a, someone who was really good at, uh, at, at rope climbing, who was in fact George Benjamin's brother, Charlie. And we went back to the cliff with, with Charlie Benjamin. And he went down the cliff and brought up these first specimens ever to have been seen for 120 years. And because he needed both his hands free, because it was a very steep and dangerous cliff, he had tied one specimen he had uh, in, his, in his sweater and tied it around his waist. And he had another specimen between his teeth. And so he climbed up the cliff. And when he came up over the cliff, I remember this, this long, supposedly extinct plant it, it, between his teeth. <laughs> it was the most wonderful memory uh, that I have. And it has a happy ending because we managed to take those fragments that Charlie brought up and propagated. And now it's, um, it's not only commonly found on St. Helena, uh, where people take great pride in the St. Helena eb ebony, uh, but also it is in some botanical gardens elsewhere in the world. So I was visiting San Diego the other day and I went to the San Diego Zoo and there in the San Diego Zoo, I suddenly came across a plant of the St. Helena ebony. <laughs> and, and that was quite a nice surprise because, uh, you know, I, I knew that that plant would have come by some circuitous route from the plant that Charlie brought up from the cliff that day. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Um, and I like how the that story breaks down some of the stereotypes of, of botanists, you know, you know, it's you know, a very exciting story. So um, let's see. Oh, I also want to point out that Nicole has po uh, posted a couple of links to the some photos of Rafflesia and Trogatiopsis. Uh, so you can take check out the photos there on those links, St. Helena Ebony. And um, maybe I'll just also encourage people that to, uh, ch uh, you know, type in your questions. You have a, we have a couple of minutes left, so please do uh, put in your questions now. And I'm going to ask one, um, uh, do you have another favorite flower that you could talk to us about? Well, okay, so... Um... Uh, many, fair, I suppose, if I was asked for what I think the most beautiful flower is, I would have to say um, the Pride of Burma, which is a particular favorite of mine. That's the Latin name is Amherstia nobilis. Um, and it is, um, well, there are many extraordinary things about Amherstia. If you, if you travel in the tropics, you will often see it planted um, because uh, it's a beautiful tropical ornamental tree but it was originally found just in some remote forests in Burma. And it's only been found in the wild a couple of times. It is so rare that very few people living have ever seen it. But because it's so beautiful, it's been propagated and you can see it in many tropical countries. But the flowers, it's, a, it's in the pea family. The flowers are, um, are scarlet and yellow and they're very sort of spidery they they um uh it's hard hard to describe but um they, some people describe them as like an orchid which isn't strictly accurate but it it gives you the idea it's sometimes called the orchid tree and um it is when you see it uh, flowering in a tropical botanical garden, it, it is uh, simply stunning um, and uh, uh, something to look out for when you're traveling in the tropics. Am Amherstia nobilis. Fantastic. Um, I don't see, uh, oh, uh, the, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. So I'm going to ask one more. Um, I'm going to end off with what tips do you have for any budding young botanists? We have a lot of children and youth uh, coming through the museum. Uh, any, any tips there? 
Yes. So I would say um, study and learn about what really interests you because um, you're going to do your, your best work and you'll have um, and just um, really succeed if you're, if you're following your interests and passions. So if there's some, something that really interests you, um, find out as much as you can about, about it. People will then say, oh, but you should be studying this because it's more important. But if it doesn't, if that other thing doesn't interest you, you won't be able to give it your that extra special attention. And so, so study. My tip for people would be study what you love. Fantastic. Oh, I do have one more question from Sheila. That's a wonderful tip, by the way. Um, so uh, Sheila asks uh, about possible expansion of the, 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 the museum and, and the research center. And she uh, wonders if you uh, had to choose one researcher that you would think would add a good research perspective to the present research team, who might that be? Uh, a specific discipline or field of study, for example. Uh, so not a specific person necessarily. Um, well, I'm that, that's a <laughs> that's that that's that's a ball with a sp spin on it. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say the the researcher I'd love to have in the museum is Charles Darwin, uh -huh. and uh, if he's available, I'll sign him up tomorrow because I think Darwin was such a brilliant naturalist and people still read The Origin of Species and his other works today, um, not just as historical curiosities, but actually as sources of inspiration and knowledge. Um, they're, uh, they're still valuable as science and not many people, there's not many people you can say that about, that, um, um, you know, 150 years of, after, um, uh, their, uh, um, their, their life, are they still, their works are still read as valuable science. And, uh, and that kind of extraordinary natural history, science rooted in natural history that can change the way we think about the world is how I would love to see the BT Museum. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Quentin. Uh, we again, really appreciate your time. I think that was really fascinating. There's a lot of thank yous in the chat as well, if you wanted to take a look from everybody for answering their questions and for this fascinating talk, as, as Kirsten says. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to end off the session with a few slides just to say goodbye. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, did you have any last thoughts you wanted to give before that? Are you, you're okay? No, just, just to say thank you very much for organizing this and, uh, and I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I hope to uh, see everyone in the museum in due course. Great, thank you. Okay, here's my slide here. Okay, so we did questions here. So um, I just wanted to say that if you're looking for a way to support the museum, here are a couple of websites. We've got the donation website and the membership website. And of course, now we're open again, so you can come visit us. So uh, please do come over. And uh, next week, we have a session from Ildico. Ildico is our collections curator of the Cow and Tetrapod collection for the birds. And she is going to be uh, doing a talk on, uh, or sorry, a, a session on albatrosses. Uh, and uh, you can connect with us on social media. Uh, and, um, and we'll say goodbye. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And you can let yourselves out of the room. Uh, and hopefully see you next week. Thanks.